You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series that syndicates for the A-List Online. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith. Welcome to the show. The interview subject coming up for you is one of the most underrated guitarists of all time. Certainly, in terms of recognition, it is Mike Campbell, who has been in part of been a part of way too many bands to mention, but a couple that I will mention up front. He's currently in Fleetwood Mac. He was Tom Petty's partner in crime for many years there, prior to his untimely passing. And there's a heap of other bands that we talk about throughout the conversation. But the catalyst for the chat with Mike is his new album with a group that he put together recently called The Dirty Knobs. There you go. The Dirty Knobs. The album, which will be out on the 20th of November via BMG, is called Reckless Abandon. So let's see what Mike has to say. Here we go. Mike, it's Andy McKay-Smith calling for our chat. How are you going? Hey, how are you doing? Doing good. I'm doing well. It's uh, it's the morning here. I've just got the kids ready because I said I'm, I'm talking to Mike, so you can't bug me. I've got. To, I've been looking forward to this conversation or the potential for this conversation for some time. So we uh, we got all of the because uh, it's the morning over here. It's twenty past seven. So we uh, got all of oh. the usual morning stuff out of the way. Just uh, they're watching TV at the moment. A rare morning where they can watch TV, but that's cool because I'm chatting to you. I understand. <laughs> How's the calls been going with us Australian media types? Have they been enjoyable compared to the rest of the world? Um, I'm sorry, what was that question? How, how, how is the, the what? How have the interviews, the calls been going with Australian media types? The interviews, yeah. I've been doing a lot of interviews uh, recently, and it's all going really good. Um, everybody seems to like the record, and uh, they've been really nice. So has, has the general consensus with Reckless Abandoned which is, of course, the name of the new album from your outfit, The Dirty Knobs. Is the general consensus been that it's a bit of a combination of all of the wonderful work that you've done over the years? I mean, you, you really, you yourself are one of the who's who, but you've played with the who's who as well. Yeah. Well, Reckless Abandon is, is a rock and roll record. It's very simple, just, and it's all mostly live, which I love. Hmm. Most of the solos and everything are live on the floor. And um, I love the songs. It's a great little band. You know, we were ready to go back in February before all hell broke loose. Mm-hmm. And we've just been waiting, and uh, we finally decided it was time to put it out, even without a tour. Okay, so were these songs that you'd written relatively recently, or have these been in the vault for many years? It's about half and half. <clears throat> so were they... How did you... Because it sounds like as though everything seems to flow together fairly naturally. So how did you get the older songs, the songs that have been around for a while, to marry up with some of the ones that you'd worked on recently? And how, how did you decide which songs made the, made the cut for the album? Well, by luck. <laughs> we, uh, we cut a lot of songs, and um, most of them were in this, the relative same vein as the album, you know, rock and boogie and stuff, mm. and some acoustic things. And actually, to be honest with you, I got a little confused because we cut so many great tracks. Hmm. I depended on my producer, George Draculius, to help me to narrow it down to 12 songs that sounded about right, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you need that outside input from time to time, don't you? Because you get so close to things. When I was a writer, that happens with me with some of my stuff, and I get my wife to look over my shoulder and she says, no, that's shit, remove it. And I, uh, right. I think, yeah, fair enough. I, I, yeah, I do that too. <laughs> So I love your lyrics too, I've got to say, and, and fuck that guy. That's a, a killer cut. It certainly is the anthem to the year 2020, certainly the outlaw anthem for the year 2020, because that guy could be anyone, depending on your perspective on things. But for you, Mike, do lyrics come easily to you? Do you write them fairly simply, or, or is it more of an arduous process? No, they come very simple. Um, I mean, when I first started with the Heartbreakers, I didn't write any lyrics, you know, because Tom was so good that I didn't feel any ambition to write my own lyrics. And then as time went on, I started messing around with uh, stuff in the studio because Tom couldn't handle all the music I was giving him. Hmm. So I would work on them, and I slowly uh, got to where uh, I can write lyrics pretty quickly. And once I get the general idea and once the switch turns on, I can get it down on paper pretty quick. Okay. 
Just mentioning Tom there, was Reckless Abandon, is it something, I wouldn't say a tribute, but obviously the opportunity to do something like this is uh, not for the greatest reasons, because unfortunately Tom has moved on to the great gig in the sky. But mm -hmm. is this is something like this a bit of a tribute for you to the work that you did with Tom and to indeed Tom as a man himself? Well, of course it is. I dedicated the, Tom, the, the album to Tom, and he's been my songwriting partner and... and uh, life partner and uh, dream partner for my whole life. So um, hmm. a lot of what I do I owe to my friend and I'm sure vice versa. Um, so that's why, yeah, I dedicated it to him. And uh, the, Al the, the, the Dirty Knobs is, is a different band than the Heartbreakers. First of all, it's a different singer and writer, but it's also just a two-guitar band. There's no keyboards. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just a live band, you know. We don't... We don't uh, put a lot of overdubs or anything. I wanted to catch everybody just playing the four of us at once in the studio and get a bigger guitar sound to fill it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's I think that makes us stand apart a little bit from the Heartbreakers. Yeah, great. And I love the musicians you've got around you too because I, I too am a musician, so I tend to listen with those ears. But you've got guitarist Jason Sine. I think that's how you pronounce his surname. That's, yeah, uh, drummer. Great Matt drummer, Lord. Matt Log, and a bass player... Uh, we call Crawdaddy. His name is Lance Morrison. And Daddy. they just showed up. You know, I yeah. didn't audition for a band. They just sort of organically showed up at my house. And we headed off, and uh, we loved playing together. Mm. Yeah, it, it comes across. It's, uh, as Keith Richards always said, you, you've got to be so tight you can afford to be loose. And that certainly is, that's very appropriate for you guys. Reckless abandon. <laughs> right there. Right there. Look, the other thing too is I love the cover, and uh, that was before I found out Klaus Vorman did it for you as well. So, was that something that he already had in the vault somewhere as well? He had already conjured, or did you ask him to commission something specific for you? No, we asked him. I'd never met Klaus, or if I did, it was so brief I don't remember. But uh, I just had a rough idea of a train kind of going through a, you know, reckless abandon through a. A gate too fast, like with me hanging out the window. And uh, my my assistant here at the house used to live in Germany and worked in an office with Klaus for a while. And she said, "Why don't you just ask Klaus to do it?" And I said, "Is he still around?" She said, "Yeah, he's still doing stuff." So we sent him the record, and he loved it. And he uh, he did the logo and the cover for us. I was thrilled. Yeah, it's fantastic. Have you have you got? I think you've got a lot of merch organized for it because I imagine. An awesome T-shirt with that on the front and the tour dates on the back would be flying off the shelves at your shows, at least. Anyway, whenever you can get back to shows, that is. Yeah, we have when we get back. I have my fingers crossed. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Have you got plans for touring that? I mean, obviously, once it all uh, settles down, this COVID stuff, which you so eloquently addressed yeah. in the Fuck That Guy video, are you planning on coming down to Australia and then going to Europe or, or thereabouts? Absolutely. I want to go everywhere, you know. This is my band, and it's my chance to do what I want to do. And I want—I love the band, and I think we're really great live. Uh, we just did a a, a private uh, showcase sort of thing at the Troubadour here with no audience, and uh, you know, heavy medical mm -hmm. protocol with all the testing and everything. And we just had the crew and a band in there with the film crew, and we played the whole album live at the Troubadour. And uh, so we, that's our tour. <laughs> So at least nice. we have some uh, <laughs> live version of what the album is. And, yes. uh, you know, I just, it's like you said, this is one of those crazy times in life. I've got dates on hold in June, but I don't really, I, don't really, I wouldn't bet money that those will still be there, depending on the medical uh, situation. But uh, if we have to push it back again, we'll push it back again. Yeah. But I love the band, and I really, I want to take them everywhere, you know, I want to play the world. Yeah, I, I could definitely see you and uh, Jimmy Barnes down here doing something together. A bit of a, a, a you know, a two pronged tour. Oh, you cool. Know Jimmy, is. yeah, Jimmy would be fantastic. I think it'd just be a really, it'd just be a wonderful evening of raucous rock and roll. Good. You know, so you you have and you are, as I mentioned before, one of them, and you still work with some of the biggest names in the music business. Now, you, you are the type of musician that I think anybody who's ever listened to radio, so practically everybody in the Western Hemisphere outside of people that are in cults or what have you, will have heard. But my question for you is, what's the toughest session you've ever done? 
Wow. Well, I don't do too many sessions outside the Heartbreakers, um, so it's it's hard to remember when I did uh, work outside the band. Um, I did a session once for the Traveling Wilburys, uh, who yeah. I know those guys, and we get along really well, but they were doing their first record. They had this song, Handle With Care, mm-hmm. and yep. uh, Tom and Jeff said, we should get Mike down to play the guitar, you know, and I'm a... I'm a huge George Harrison fan. So I took my amp and my slide guitar down there and set it up and played along with the track a little bit. And I just didn't feel, I, I felt intimidated. You know, I felt like this is a, you know, this I shouldn't be on this. I would rather hear George Harrison's feel on this song. So I, I, I told him, I said, you know, like, and Jeff said, no, what you played is good. And I said, no, it's not. It's not as good as what George could do. So I handed him my guitar, and he played that amazing slide solo that's on the record. Mm. And uh, so, in a way, that was um, difficult because I had to accept that you know he could do it better. But I'm glad I decided to back off and let him do it. Well, you, the reason I think that's a, that's such an important point. The reason I th- one of the key reasons I think you've obviously been been a part of so much great music over the years is you not just know your limitations. Or your boundaries, but yeah. you understand what I've other. I've got musicians plenty of limitations, are. but I try to make the best of it, you know. Yeah, well, but you understand what other musicians' strengths are. So if you hadn't suggested, I don't, I don't want to do this. Let George do this. The song might not have become the immortal song that it's become. It's, it's just one part of it. I get that, but you, you understand my point. You know, it's all, it's all. That's your input, and that's a significant piece of input. Well, at least he did use my amp and my guitar, so I'm sort of in it. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there is an album that I remember when I was a kid from Paula Abdul called Spellbound, and I think you were on that as well. And the song Rush, Rush, did you feature on that one? I don't think that's me. I think there's another session player named Mike Campbell from New York. And so I don't. I never played on a Paula Abdul song. Is that right? Okay, that's, it's listed here as, as part of your credit, so there you go. <laughs> you got it wrong. If I did, I certainly don't remember ever playing on one of her records. I don't think they would call my style on her records. But uh, no, I don't remember that. It's got to be a misprint or something. Okay, all right. Good to know. Good to know. Now, one one of your songs, and this must be pretty surreal. I, I don't. People aren't aware that you wrote "The Boys of Summer." That's your song, and it's been covered a few times. And I think it's even the cover versions have even gone on to be. You know, when I say successful in a commercial sense, like you got the DJ Sammy version, which was an enormous dance floor hit about twenty years ago, and the mm. Ataris did a punk version. So, what what did you think yeah. of those two versions? Well, I like them both. Um, you know, I like the original better, but I was just honored that someone else would take the song and uh, make it their own. You know, a, a good song can be done by you know different people interpreted different ways. Mm. But, you know, I'm just grateful that I got that song. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an all-time classic. It's a song that almost anybody, as I said before, it's uh, if you're in the Western Hemisphere, that if you show them the song, they'd go, well, they'd at least remember the hook, that's for sure. So is it, you're a bit like Don Henley in that way, in that, that people don't realise that you are a classic songwriter. Do you sometimes, and I don't know Bob Daisley from the Aussie band has had this happen to him as well, but have you been around people at, have talked about how much they love the song and they're talking to you about how much they love the song and they've got no idea that you actually wrote it? Yeah, yeah, that's happened before. <laughs> I just smile. I don't, t- I don't tell them. I just go, that's cool. <laughs> I like, I, and I guess they'll figure it out later. Or, you know, occasionally I might say, oh, yeah, I co-wrote that song. And they go, really? And they go, oh, my God, and I like it even more now, you know. <laughs> so that's just one of those songs. You know, I've been lucky. I've written a lot of songs with Tom. And some yes. of them are well known, some of them aren't, but I'm very proud of all of them. Well, you you work with Stevie Nicks, obviously you still do with Fleetwood Mac these days, but Belladonna. Um, I mean that album took her from being a a member of a band to being a superstar. So, what are your recollections of the sessions for Belladonna? Well, I remember Jimmy Iovine produced it, and. Uh, Tom and I had this song, which we co-wrote, called Stop Dragging My Heart Around. And Jimmy Iovine suggested it would work good as a duet. And he was was beginning to work with Stevie, so he brought her in. That's kind of how we met her. Hmm. And they did the song, and so we just gave her the song because she did so good on it. 
and uh, you know that album I, I think I played on a couple of other tracks just played some guitar here and there but I think it's one of the best uh, you know so first solo records out of a person in a band especially a woman oh uh, yeah definitely. it was very st yeah. strong uh, establishment of her as a solo artist mm. And then, and then I thought the other side of the mirror is an outstanding album as well. Did you have a lot of input in the songwriting process with that one? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I know that over the next few years we wrote, uh, I don't know, five or six songs that ended up on this album or that album, but uh, none, none were as uh, memorable as "Stop Dragging My Heart Around." Yeah, oh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Do you sometimes? You see, you, you're a down-to-earth bloke, okay? So, you, you know, you, when I say that, you know, you're, you're a normal bloke. You catch regular flights. You know, you occasionally probably have a hangover, this sort of thing, if you still drink, that is. Do you sometimes have to pinch yourself and, and look back over your career and go, wow, that's that's been fantastic? Yeah, all the time. I can't believe it, really. Um, I talk to my wife about it occasionally. And I just go like, how did we get here? <laughs> you know, and uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews and in, in which... Uh, a lot of people want to know about the early days, you know, and I think back to mm. when I was starting, and I had no clue that I was going to meet all these people and have all this success. You know, I just loved the music so hard, and, and Tom and I were both, you know, we came from a very poor background, and we just hit, hit it together, and we had the same dream. And, you know, damn if it didn't come true, and then some. So I, I'm just, uh, yeah, I just have to pinch myself all the time. You know, I look around my house and I see my guitars and I hear the records and I, and I sometimes I think, it's, how did I do that? <laughs> how lucky yeah. am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, y and you, you played with the godmother as well, Aretha. I don't know whether people realize this, but you featured on the album Who's Zoom and Who. So was she actually there when you did the lead guitar track for the play? Oh, the I just play? did an overdub on the track. Unfortunately, I did not get to meet her, but God, is she amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your your resume is, um, I might give you a compliment I don't think I've given anybody before, but I don't think anybody's got a resume like yours. You're talking, I mean, these are artists that, even if you don't know the name, you've heard the music. So Susanna Hoffs is obviously uh, the Bangles, was it? Uh, yeah, the Bangles. And uh, then you've got Rob Thomas, Tracy Chapman, Randy Newman, Bob Dylan. People don't realise yeah. Bob Dylan. Yeah, it was it was it Bob in the okay, this is what journalists say, and I'm a journalist, so I don't like bullshitting. Trust me, I hate fake news. But people have got this idea: journalists espoused by journalists that Bob is a hard guy to work with. And I've heard through other musicians. Oh no, no, no! He's the easiest guy ever. Yeah, that's what he I is. Think. Such a sweetheart, and uh, we hit it off really well. And um, he's really fun to work with. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what he's like to work with in his personal life, but in the studio and on tour, he was a saint. Mm. And you also worked with Bob Seger as well, The Fire Inside. Yeah, that was a, that's hard to remember that one, but yeah, I guess that was probably Jimmy Iving around the time Jimmy Iving was producing him. I'm sorry, but you know, I'm I'm I've been around a long time, and some of these things that are you know decades ago, I don't necessarily remember them very clearly. <laughs> no, I mean it's, but, look, it's just uh, a wonderful I love tribute. Bob Seger. It's just a wonderful tribute to your talent that you've been able to be so versatile and work with all of these great musicians. And see, for me as a young fella, I wanted to be like yourself or Al Anderson from um, the Bob Marley band, you know, the Whalers, in that you want, to be, you want to be so versatile and you want to have the sort of personality that can mesh with other personalities and fit into so many broad environments that you, can, you have a resume like what yours is now because, as I say, it's, it's peerless. Well, um, I'm very grateful for that, and I feel, uh, you know, I think a lot, there's a lot of luck involved and timing, you know, you can have talent, uh, but if you don't have the, if you're not in the right place the right day when something happened, you know, you might miss that, that uh, chance, and uh, I've been very fortunate to meet the right people like Tom and these other people you mentioned that uh, are kind enough to respect me enough to want me to help them on their records, I mean, I, I'm just kind of blown away by it all, really. I'll make this my final question for you, so I appreciate your time here. And uh, from from your time oh. with Tom and and working with him, is, is there anything out there in the public domain that is wrong? Like, is there any perceptions about the man that you'd like to correct? Uh, no. No, I think it's all out there. I mean, if you want to know Tom, 
just listen to the songs, listen to the words, listen to his voice, listen to his soul. That's what he was like, you know. And I don't think there's any misconceptions that I'm aware of. Everybody thinks of Tom as, as a guy that loved music and lived for rock and roll, and that's that's who he was. He was my friend. Beautifully summarized, mate. Yeah. Mike, thanks so much for the conversation. Congratulations on an outstanding career. Thank you. You can tell I'm a fan. Good luck with everything and I hope when all this bloody hope stuff Hope we make it over. down there with the dirty knobs. I'd love to play down there with them. Oh, absolutely, mate. I'll be in the audience, definitely. Well, yeah, <laughs> if we do, definitely come back and say hi. I'll, I'll want to do that. That'd be awesome, mate. It'd be great to have a beer or coffee, whatever it is you partake in these days. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, stay safe. Thanks, mate. You too. Appreciate it, Mike. Cheers, all mate. All right, bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, one of the most underrated guitarists in the biz, Mr. Mike Campbell, the current guitarist in Fleetwood Mac. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of this show, the Scars and Guitars podcast that syndicates for the A-List Online. Thank you so much for listening.